Hello, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for having me. How are you doing? Okay. Yeah, um, we were on tour, the mission, in uh, March, middle of March. We Actually, we were in Europe and um, our tour was curtailed in, uh, when we were in Lisbon. <clears throat> and we had made a mad dash back to the UK. Um, the borders were closing behind us as we were going back to England on the bus. And then we, Craig and I, got dropped off at Heathrow and managed to get ourselves, both of us, on uh, flights home. Him, Craig, to the US, Maryland, and me home to Brazil the following day. And then a day or so after that, the, long, the lockdowns were um, enforced. So we were quite lucky, actually. But I came home to Brazil. Uh, we have a place in the countryside here in Brazil. And um, I, uh, I started getting messages from um, people online and uh, social media asking um, if, if it's okay for them to play Tower of Strength uh, in hospitals and at work and stuff like that as it was becoming a little bit of an anthem for some people. Of course, you know, we said, yeah, of course. Um, and it just got me to thinking, you know, I, I would like to do something here, I'd like to help some way. I, I, you know, I've been very blessed in my life and um, very blessed to be able to make a living from music. And I just wanted to, I don't know, give something back, I guess. So um, I was in conversation with Michael Cirovolo from Schecter Guitars, the CEO, who's a good friend of mine. He's also um, the curator of the Beauty and Chaos um, <clears throat> project, which, uh, and I've worked with him on a few songs um, in that project, with that project. And we came up with this idea of um, doing a new version of Tower of Strength. And um, we, we, we thought about other songs. We thought about Heroes, actually, by David Bowie. You know, it's a great, great song. But then I looked at the lyrics and thought, it doesn't really work, you know. This is a love song about, you know, lovers at the Berlin Wall. I don't know if it kind of fits. But then, you know, I thought, well, why not Tower of Strength? Lyrically, it works. It's, uh, it means a lot to a lot of our audience. Um, it's, it's anthemic. It's, um, yeah, it's that point of communion in a mission show, you know, that um, no matter how good or bad a show is, it's, it's always a highlight. It's always a moment of communion. And so we decided on Tower. Um, yeah, and that was, uh, that was how we came about that. Uh, no, not really. I mean, obviously the mission for me in many respects, the mission version is the definitive version, always will be. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's, it's a song that's kind of universal, you know, and it can be applied to a lot of situations. Obviously, when I wrote it, I wrote it actually for the mission audience at a time when I was pretty low. Um, but it's obviously got, um, more meaning than that for, for other people. You know, it's been played in many different, under very many different circumstances. So um, it just seemed to fit. Um, so, I, but no, I didn't really feel I had to be faithful. Although what I did was um, <clears throat> I started off with a very basic drum loop and um, recorded some 12 string, strummed 12 string acoustic guitars over the top of that. And then I did a guide vocal, and that's what I sent out to everybody. Um, basically said, you know, here you are, do what you want to do with it, you know. And um, so nobody really heard what anybody else had done or was doing. Um, you know, it was all, uh, that's all they had to work with. Uh, so it was quite interesting part of the process for me, actually, just to, to hear what everybody was coming up with uh, independently. Um, yeah, that was that was a nice part of it. I quite enjoyed that.
Well, yeah, I mean, um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, meet a lot of other musicians over the years and some of, some of whom have become friends. Um, some are just acquaintances, you know, but, you know, you, you, obviously you meet people in the same business. And uh, so kind of um, for my address book, and I've got, you know, I basically approached people who I considered friends, first of all, I think, I suppose, and um, asked if they would be up for doing this. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, most people, uh, well, I wasn't going to say most, most people that I initially approached were, yeah, you know, count me in. Um, Martin Gore, Gary Newman, Miles Hunt, you know. Um, and then um, once I started, uh, getting some positive answers, um, positive response. I uh, started searching further afield in approaching people that I hadn't really met before. Um, you know, um, I got people to introduce, in, introduce me, um, mutual friends and stuff like that. And even a few, few occasions I reached out to people that just, you know, got a uh, contact address online. Um, some of which, some of whom replied and were very courteous and but declined and uh, some, a fair few didn't bother replying at all, which is fair enough, you know, I know, I know how it is. Um, and uh, there were a few actually who I would consider friends and uh, it um, declined too. So, you know, um, they've been struck, st struck off the Christmas card list now anyway. Um, so that's, that's, that's how I kind of approach people, you know, and gradually over a period of time, um, you know, I got more and more people to commit and got more and more audio files in. Um, you know, singers were the hardest to find, I have to, I have to, I have to say. Um, singers are a weird bunch, and I can say that. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was... Uh, it was quite a lengthy process, you know, some people said yeah, and then they would, next day in my inbox, there would be uh, emails from them with some audio files. Uh, some people would say yes, and I would have to chase them for the next six weeks, you know, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, it was, that's how I kind of got people involved. Yeah, well, there were, you know, there were, as I said before, there were some people that um, I approached that said no. Um, but most, yeah, most people were, you know, um, up for doing it. And um, I mean, basically, it, you know, it was whether or not the, um, they could record at home, that they had the facility to do so. I mean, um, for example, uh, most, most people, most people could, you know, had at least a laptop that they could record onto. But there were some, I mean, it's a weird thing with musicians of my generation that, um, you know, I would say 70% of us can, you know, know how to record on the laptop, know how to record at home. But there are, you know, there's a percentage there, and it's not a small percentage, there's a percentage there that really don't have any idea how to do that. And um, Billy Diff Duffy was one, surprisingly, that surprised me a little bit, but... Uh, Anyway, I ended up persuading Billy just basically to play the backing track on his stereo, um, put his guitar through an amp and just record it on his phone, send me the file. And then I would, I, I edited it down obviously and chose the best bits, but uh, that's how we recorded Billy. But most people, you know, they had, they, you know, they had little studio setups at home. Um, Ian Asprey was gonna sing, but unfortunately he, uh, him and his partner, they were, they had two laptops, which both went down the same week. And obviously being in lockdown, they uh, couldn't go and get them fixed. So um, I tried to persuade Ian to do what Billy had done and sing on his phone, but he wasn't having it, which is fair enough. You know, I'm again, I understand how singers are. Well, you know, really the preference would be to, you know, work 
with people face to face, you know, be in the same room together, but that was never going to be possible. And even if we weren't in lockdown, I, I would say, you know, because I live in Brazil, it would be very difficult to get 22 musicians down here to, uh, all in one place. But, uh, you know, then again, we wouldn't have done it in the first place, I don't suppose. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, as, they, as I said, they all sent files, audio files, which then um, I would sit through. I mean, some, for instance, some singers sang the whole song for me. Um, Gary sang the whole song a couple of times. Uh, Miles sang it uh, all the way through. James Alexander Graham did. Um, Martin Gore. But then other people like Midjor only sang the first verse, the first chorus. And um, the Aston Brothers only sung one verse each. You know, so basically, um, they, as I said earlier, they, 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 you know, they just did what they wanted to do, what they felt comfortable doing, which is fair enough. Absolutely fair enough. And then the same with the guitarists. I mean, basically, you know, I mean, to get everybody on there at the version had to be, end up being nearly 10 minutes long. You know, you know what guitarists are like. It's like to play. But um, there was some great stuff, you know. Um, saying that, it did take me probably about a week to edit the guitars alone. Uh, you know, Robin Fink, and I think he sent like 14 tracks of guitars, which um, is quite a lot of editing. Some great stuff there, though, mind. Um, same with Richard Fortas. There was a lot of guitars. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of guitars to edit. And just to pick bits and, and and make sure make sure they worked, make sure I pick the best bits, make sure they work within the track and what with what else was going on. Same with drums, you know, Budgie, Budgie, I knew from back in late seventies actually. Um, he and I were in a band together for about two days, uh, a short lived band when we both lived in Liverpool. Um, obviously, we went our separate ways over the years but you know we, I've bumped into him once or twice through the years and um, he is one of my favourite drummers of all time so to get him involved on this was uh, was quite a coup for me I think it was um, one of my um, favourite um, participators shall we say uh, but Budgie lives in Berlin um, he didn't have access to a studio or anything but Fortunately, he'd been in um, California working with Lol Tolhurst um, before the lockdowns, and I just recorded a bunch of drums in a studio, just you know, random playing to a click track. Um, he said, "Look, you can use these, you know, if you can get something out of these drums, um, great. Then you can use these." And he, so he sent me the, the, the files. I have to say, they sounded fantastic, and it, you know, Bush Budgie playing drums, it sounds great, you know but the actual sound of it too. I think they did it actually in Tommy Lee's studio um, in um, on the coast there. But um, yeah, so, but there was, again, there was a lot of uh, drums, basically a, a, a 18 tracks of drums actually, but I had to sit there and find the best bits and then kind of cut edited stuff out and um, cut it out and imported it into the song, you know, built the track up that way. Again, it was a lengthy process and I had a bit of help with that because editing drums are, is quite a specialist thing. So, um, yeah, that's how we got Budgie on it. Um, yeah, so the process of editing was quite lengthy, but as I said before, it, it was also very interesting because, as, you know, nobody had actually heard what anybody else had played. So uh, it, making it all work was... Um, all together and it was quite a, quite a job but um, I mean I got it to a point where I was I thought it all worked together and then that's when I sent it to Tim Palmer to mix sent the files the edited files to Tim uh, yeah <laughs> yeah, with a little bit of chicanery, I think. Um, yeah, a little bit. We were a little bit naughty there. I mean, Jay is a friend of mine. Um, uh, Gene loves Jezebel. Have played with the Mission many times. Jay's version of Gene loves Jezebel, and they were actually even on tour with us when the tour was cancelled in March. When the when we all 
raced home, although Jaya ended up having to space to spend some time in Spain, I believe, not being able to get home immediately. Um, and Michael, Michael Cirovolo, is a, a friend of uh, Michael Aston's. And they, they, I mean, Michael Cirovolo has played in the other Gene Loves Jezebel. So we, we hatched this plan. There's a little bit of conniving going on, for sure. Um, we hatched this plan. I was going to ask Jay, and he was going to ask Michael. And we wouldn't tell the other. So that's what we did. And we said, OK, you both sing the last verse. I mean, sing the last verse. We asked them both to sing the last verse. And then so, you know, we got the audio files in. I, I edited, it, it edited the files. And then as we were mixing, I thought, you know what? We better tell them. We better make sure that it's OK. They're both OK with it. So we, you know, we came clean. And um, I emailed Jay and Michael, emailed Michael and told them what was going on. And, uh, you know, bless them. Both of them were fine with it. Um, very gracious. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously it's a bigger cause. Um, but yes, I think it was the first time they both sang on the same song since uh, 1987 or something. So that was, yeah, that was quite something. Quite pleased that that could happen. I'm not sure it's going to do any good in the long term, but, you know, here's hoping, you know. I mean, I have met Michael before. Uh, as I said, Jay is my friend, but I've met Michael before. You know, they're both good boys, both nice boys. It's boys. You know what I mean? Anyway, yeah, 